be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. In considering what to speak about tonight, feeling the energy of the retreat and the people in interviews today and so forth. Last night Sharon spoke a lot about loving kindness toward oneself and the world and before that it was the four most difficult things and before that it was the four noble truths with the emphasis on suffering. It seemed like it was time for Something uplifting. (laughs) And inspiring. I went to India this winter, as I've told some of you, I believe, partly to practice on my own, but also in traveling to collect uh, audio tapes, interviews with some great masters in India on the question of spirituality and social responsibility. And as well to do some filming for a short um, video piece. Interviewed lots of people, Mother Teresa and the Dalai Lama. Basically, it was a good excuse to go and hang out with some, some really extraordinary people. And one group of people that we interviewed, people I was working with, were associates of Gandhi, people who'd worked closely with him in his time. Gandhi was quite extraordinary. Not only was he very much the central figure of this century, if not in our time, of application of Dharma to worldly life and politics and and the kinds of um, social governmental problems, but also he was an incredible ecologist He really was concerned about ecology on all levels. And he was an incredible economist and talked about having small and appropriate technology in villages that were right for that culture. It was really ahead of his time in a lot of ways. And it came, of course, not just through being smart, but somehow being in touch with the Dharma in a real deep way. And we felt that in the people that still run the many Gandhi ashrams and Gandhi-inspired programs in India. One of the people that we interviewed, there were several actually, were folks who worked with a man named Vinoba Bhave, who probably few of you have heard of. Vinoba was Gandhi's main Dharma heir. He was the person who had been perhaps closest to Gandhi for periods of his life. And after Gandhi was shot in 1949, the whole movement was in some confusion. The country had gained independence, there was separation, there was all the struggle and fighting between Muslims and Hindus. People didn't know what to do. And after a year or so, they decided to call a conference of all the close followers of Gandhi bring them together and see how to continue his spirit, work, and movement. So they called the conference, they said it, and they called this man, Vinoba Bhave, Vinobaji, and asked him to please come to the conference and help chair it. And he said, I don't have anything to say. I, the country's independent and I, I don't know what to do. I, you know, hold it without me. And they said, please come. We can't do without you. You're the closest person to him, and we need you here. And he said, no, and they insisted, and finally he said, all right, I'll come, but I want to walk. was halfway across India, of course. Um, And they said, fine. They scheduled it, giving him enough time to walk. So he started to walk from where he was toward the conference. 
And as was his tradition and the tradition of Gandhi, um, he started to walk to this conference and he'd stop and have meetings in the village as Gandhi used to, just to meet the people and find out what it was like. And he was particularly interested since it was 1950 now and Indian independence had just happened. And he heard their tales of sorrow and difficulty and struggle and tried to be inspiring village industry, home spinning and so forth. He got to one village partway there and this group of Harijans of untouchables came and said, it's just terrible. We have no money. We have nothing to eat. We can't support ourselves. What can we do, Vinobhaji? And he said, well, why don't you farm? Why don't you grow something? Don't be so lazy. And they said, we can't. We don't have any land. And he thought about it. They said, we're landless. We we have nothing but these little huts to live in. He listened to them complain. He said, well, when I go back to Delhi after the conference, I'll talk to the government and I'll see if we can get some kind of a government land grant to you and some other people that need it. And, and uh, maybe that will help. And he went to sleep to meditate and then to sleep. And he called a meeting the next morning before he left the village and he said, I'm sorry, I have to apologize to you. That was a bad idea. I know that if I go to Delhi, it'll be probably not till eight months from now. And they'll be busy forming the new government and they'll listen to me. And even if they do make some land grant proposal, it'll probably end up with the rich people like it always does and you'll never get any land. And they were more dejected than ever. At least it was honest. And uh, then some man stood up in the meeting and he said, I have land. How much do these people need? And so there were 16 families. They needed 80 acres of land, five acres of family to grow, to live. So he said, all right, I'll give 80 acres of my land. I have plenty of land to them. And Vinobhaji said, no, don't give it. Go home, talk to your wife, to your children who inherit your land, and really make sure, check out whether it's okay for you to give it or not. So he went home, talked to them, and then they all met again the next day, the villagers. And he said, I asked, and they said it was fine. And the land was offered and given. And these 16 families each had five acres of land. So then Vinoba left that village, and he walked on to the next village on his way to the conference. And had the meeting, and people were telling of their sorrows and difficulties. And finally, a group said, well, we're so poor, we can't even feed ourselves. We don't have anything. He said, well, why don't you work? And they said, we have no wet land, no way to work. How much land do you need? 120 acres was 12 families. So he told the story of what had happened in the previous village to that village. And in the meeting, a man stood up and he said, I have 120 acres of land I can spare. And he sent him home to check it out with his family and so forth, and did. And he came back to the meeting and said, yes, I can give it, and that land was given. And in the course of walking to that conference, he collected 3,000 acres of land from village to village, and he arrived at that conference. This was in 1950. And he got up to speak. And there are Gandhi ashrams and projects and home spinning and all kinds of good things that they do around India. And he told of what had happened to him and of his concern, as had been Gandhi's, for the very poor people in India, the homeless ones, really. And he said he knew through that walking that he had found in some way his life's calling. And so he recruited some people to help him at that conference. And for the next 14 years, they did what was called the Bhutan Land Movement in India. They walked on foot through every province and most every district in India, which is the size of this country, and collected, he personally and the people who were with him, four million acres of land to give without the government. In fact, he didn't want the government a part of it because it's troublesome, as you all know. Um, <laughs> to give to villagers the poorest people who needed that. 
And the people that we interviewed and talked to were the people who had walked with Vinobhaji. Actually, the man that I work with also went to the Gandhi Ashram and interviewed Vinoba, who's now in his 90s and one of the great old saints of India. Vinoba didn't have much to tell him, actually. He was kind of hard of hearing, and he smiled and he said, yes, walk, study, <laughs> practice meditation. Yes, very good. But... <laughs> What do you expect a saint to tell you, you know? (laughs) But what's extraordinary for me about the story is that he hadn't a clue what he was going to do. He had no idea. And what did he do? He just went and he walked and he listened and he looked. He was really, he really lived in the spirit of someone who lives in the moment. In, in, an, in the unfolding, in the open of, opening of things as they are. And people think that, God, if I live in the moment, it'll be, you know, I'll be weak. I need to plan and get together and all of these things. And it's not to say that planning isn't a, an important mental function, nor to abandon it. Unfortunately, we're more possessed by it than, you, than use it. But rather to see that to live in the moment, it really brings strength and flexibility, the strength of being with what is now and responding to it, rather than being fearful and planning and building walls and and imagining what you have to deal with that will be difficult. For me, that's really the spirit of our practice. It's the spirit of our practice as we sit in this meditation hall and walk, It's equally the spirit of our practice as we work and live with our families and drive on the freeway and do all the things that are a part of what it is to be alive, to be human. That's what practice is about, is somehow to bring that spirit that Vinoba found, openness. You know, in California retreats, we don't teach walking meditation. We teach driving meditation. (laughs) No one walks there anymore. (laughs) What I'd like to talk about tonight is certain qualities that grow as one undertakes spiritual practice, called by the Buddha the factors of enlightenment. And I don't want to talk about them as some theoretical thing that, oh, gee, that sounds nice. It was written in some ancient sutra or scriptures, but really something that we can feel and experience in our own lives, in our own practice. Because for me, in a way, they're the juice of practice. They're like the sap of the tree that make things alive. And I have been taken to task a number of times by some people, even in this very room, for talking about the factors of enlightenment. And especially, I, I use a lot of images from Don Juan and the warrior. Um, Particularly one person who articulated it well, she said, you know, the, the problem, the, there, are, there are a lot of people who've talked about it, but she who articulated it best of all said, the problem is that I don't feel like a warrior. And when I hear it, when I hear talk about a warrior, you know, it, if anything, it makes me feel bad in some way or feel like, you know, I can't be, a, I'm not a warrior. In fact, she is. She doesn't know it. She's more of a warrior than a lot of the people around her. But she wants to pretend she's not a warrior. It's all right with me. <laughs> but in any case, what I hope to, to say in using these images and for you to understand is that it's not something that you have to measure or model yourself against but rather to listen and feel in yourself, in your own unique way, those qualities and those capacities. You know, in my group today, group interviews, people were dealing with very deep difficulties in a way, deep feelings of abandonment and loneliness and fear and embarrassment and uh, and dying inside somehow. And in that sense, we're all warriors together as we're willing in our sitting, in our walking, in our speech, communication. It's really hard to be honest, to be open, to be vulnerable. All the things that we do in our life, in our work, um, is the spirit. 
The first quality of a warrior, the first quality of the factor of enlightenment, really, is that of impeccability. There's a, as Don Juan says, there's a mysterious beauty that surrounds people who live their lives as warriors. There's some people who are very careful about the nature of their acts. Their happiness is to act with the full knowledge that they don't have time. Therefore, their acts have a peculiar power. Acts have power, especially when the person acting knows that those acts are their last battle. There's a strange, consuming happiness in acting with the full knowledge that whatever one is doing may very well be one's last act on earth. What matters is that a warrior be impeccable. What matters to a warrior is arriving at the totality of oneself. Impeccability. It really, the Buddhist word is sati. It means mindfulness. The fullness of being in each moment, in each experience with what's really there. With the body, which we started with, the breath and body sensations, with feelings and emotions, with thoughts, with sounds, with sights, with movement, not just sitting here, but making eating a meditation, making our work period a meditation, making everything that we do a place to bring, to collect ourselves, to bring the spirit of impeccability. Taking death as an advisor, because we don't really know, as I talked about the other night, how long we have to be here. And it's very precious, really. That's not something out there. That's not something to imagine or to set up as an ideal. Gee, I wish I were more impeccable. One of the wonderful things about practice is that each moment and each thing we do in our life is a new opportunity to be mindful, to be complete, to be whole. It's never too late and it's never lost. It's just now again with each thing, with every dish that we wash, you know, with all the words that we speak, with our sex life, with every time we make love, with every time we drive. I have very bad training in driving, actually, because I was a cab driver in Boston for a while. <laughs> and Boston traffic is bad enough, as most of you who live there know, it's quite unruly. And tab- cab drivers are, are the worst offenders. I have spent, I've driven down many a one-way street the wrong way and through. Um, but even so, I was noticing as I drive, it's not just the impeccability of care with one's driving in terms of attention and sensibility, but also there's an opportunity to be really piggy or to be kind. The kindness doesn't take much longer. But that sense of impeccability really means that everything that we do, we sense in ourselves that capacity of bringing fullness, life, of, of, of being there in a complete way. And that, for me, is what our business is here. This is kind of a kindergarten. It's a protected place where we have, where there isn't much distraction, and we're faced with ourselves, and we can move kind of slow. And we can begin to learn that capacity of impeccability, of being whole, of being full. And you know it, I mean, each of you in this time being here has had sometimes a drink of water or a a walk outside or a seeing of a flower or something that was really full in that way. Probably a lot of it, even many moments, and how wonderful it is to live with that spirit. brings dignity to life. Our accomplishments don't bring dignity. They may make us feel proud and secure a little in the world, but dignity only comes in our being in relation in each moment to what comes to us. And it's great to live in a dignified way. Dignified, by the way, doesn't mean not allowing for craziness and fun and all those things, but with a real full spirit. Now, the other factors of enlightenment, of which there are six more, 
There are three that are arousing qualities and three that are stabilizing qualities of mind. The arousing ones are energy, courage, and controlled folly, to use Don Juan's words. What's energy mean? We've talked about it a lot in this retreat. It means that it don't happen by accident. It doesn't. I'm sorry if you think you can just la-di-da through your spiritual practice. You get nowhere. It doesn't mean a striving. It doesn't mean a, I've got to get this next breath. You know, this morning we were counting the breath. Catch that next breath. That just brings tension. That's not what it is. It's the effort or the energy to stay awake and to be really honest, to really be present. It's taking the trouble to be here in a careful way. And again, it's just what you can feel growing in yourself. I mean, you're very different in a way than you were a week or more ago when you arrived. The moments of your presentness for almost everyone, even if it feels in some sittings like it's before the beginning again, if you really look at it, you're here more. And it's that, it's that energy of willingness to be here and to be present, to be awake. And that's to everything, you know. It's not to change the world, but to be with it honestly, responsively. We went to see another great Indian teacher, a woman named Vimla Thakar, who is in a certain way a Dharma heir of Krishnamurti studied with him for a long time, but with many other teachers as well. An older woman who's taught a lot of meditation and also walked for seven years on foot around India in the land movement. Um, Very inspiring. She's done both. And we went to see her because she's been involved in this project of 400 villages of village education and reform and work projects in Gujarat and 50 in Rajasthan. And I said, why did you stop teaching meditation? She was teaching retreats in order to go and go back to do this village development work. What made you do that? And she looked at me. She said, Sir, much like Krishnamurti, if any of you have heard him, she said, Sir, I am a lover of life, sir. And as a lover of life, I make no distinctions. If I see that someone or some people who I have come into contact with are lost, are unable to become aware, to become conscious to the greater spiritual realities of life, to their own potential. And I see that, what can I do but to share what I know with them? If I see villagers who don't have a house or clothes or the very basic fundamental possessions that make for human dignity, what can I do but respond to that, sir? And it was wonderful. There wasn't a shade of distinction in her mind between one and the other. And she did them both really impeccably. She was one tough old lady, I'll tell you. you know, And wonderful and tremendously warm as well. Very kind, but uncompromising. The Sufi saying is, praise Allah, but tie your camel to the post. (laughs) It's both of those things. It's in the sense of our spiritual practice. It's really to learn to listen in ourselves in the deepest way to the voice of the Dharma, of God, of nature, of the truth, and to take your time in silence, which she does and she honors but not to think that God's going to do it for you. No way. Frankly, you know, nobody going to do it for you. And so what you can see really is growing in yourself here again is the spirit. You sit in here, sometimes we sit with you, sometimes we don't sit with you, come to interviews every couple days. Really, you're on your own pretty much. And that's the way it is in life. And rather it's to find, as you do here, to sense and see your own potential growing of how to be with things as they are. It has to be balanced. It's not a forced thing. You see where Don Juan says it here. 
If one is to succeed in anything, the success must come gently, with a great deal of effort, but with no stress or obsession. Not a struggling or a striving. It's more an opening, which is scarier than striving. Striving, we're sort of still got the wheel under control and setting our course. It's not that. It's letting go of the wheel in a certain extent in terms of this control of our body and our feelings and our mind and things and saying, okay, let's just take a look at what's true, what's natural. Energy, it takes a lot. Really, it takes a lot. It's, in fact, it takes all you have. And your practice, if you see it as your life, is the endless in that regard. And people are afraid, gee, if I work too hard today, oh, then I'll be tired and I won't be able to do it tomorrow, till tom- tomorrow properly. Like we have a little bit of energy and if we use it up, we have to wait and recharge the battery. Feel it. You can see it right now. If you do something really fully, doesn't matter what it is, anything, when you do, your time here, your time at home is the same, that brings energy. The very fullness of, of being with what you do, bringing your body, your spirit, your heart together, m- makes more energy. It's like you open up to it. Energy, courage. Courage isn't physical courage. You know, jumping off cliffs with parachutes or or all the kinds of things that we think of courage, a kind of masculine kind of macho courage. Real courage is courage of the heart. Do you know about courage of the heart? It's the courage to investigate, to look, to see really honestly what's true inside ourselves. To be honest with that and to express it, to communicate it honestly as well. The courage to be open, the courage to feel, the courage to be vulnerable. And there's a secret to it, really. The secret isn't to be attached to what's pleasant and to try and avoid what's painful. I told it to the other night, but I just wanted to remind you in case you forgot. (laughs) Only as a warrior can one withstand the path of knowledge. A warrior cannot complain or regret anything. Their life is an endless challenge, and challenges can't possibly be good or bad. Challenges are simply challenges. The basic difference between an ordinary person and a warrior is that a warrior takes everything as a challenge, while an ordinary person takes everything either as a blessing or a curse. Oh, poor me, it did it to me again. It doesn't do anything to you. I mean, it does everything. It's up and down and light and dark. And what the Buddha called the, the uh, eight, you know, all these lists, um, I don't know, the eight, eight things that change all the time, the eight variables, I forget the title, but it was pleasure and pain and gain and loss and fame and ignominy and... Uh, I don't remember the other one of them. They always change. You think fame is great? Try it. For most people, it doesn't last very long. You're famous and then you're not so famous. Pleasure and pain, you've seen. Gain and loss, the same. And somehow we think that the world does it to us. It makes us happy or sad. Do you believe that? Do you believe the world makes you happy or sad? Look at it in yourself. Who makes us happy or sad? And that's part of what courage is about. Courage is really recognizing a kind of responsibility we have to ourselves and to the world. It's developing what one of my teachers called a heart of greatness. When our heart is only concerned with poor me and yes this and no that and all of those things, um, our lives are pretty painful. Because actually it's kind of a drag to just be self-concerned and boring in a way. But we have a potential in ourselves, 
again, what you can feel, it's not some ideal, but it's here. It's in every interaction. It's in everything we do in ourselves for courage, in, in every time we touch another person of greatness. And that greatness is, is really sensing an openness, a vulnerability, a truthfulness, a caring. And seeing who's responsible for our happiness and our suffering. Only one person. So what's controlled folly? The next one. A man of knowledge or a woman of knowledge chooses a path with heart and follows it. It has to be a path with heart. And looks and rejoices and laughs and sees and knows. They know that their life will be over altogether too soon, and they know that they, as well as everybody else, are not going anywhere. They know because they see that nothing is more important than anything else. In other words, a man or woman of knowledge has no honor, no dignity, no family, no name, no country, but only life to be lived. And under these circumstances, their only tie to their fellow Humans is their controlled folly. Thus a man or woman of knowledge endeavors and sweats and puffs, and if one looks at them, they look like any ordinary person, except that the folly of their life is under control. Nothing being more important than anything else, a man or woman of knowledge chooses any act and acts it out as if it matters to them. Their controlled folly makes them say that what they do matters, makes them act as if it does, yet they know it doesn't. So whatever happens when they fulfill their acts, they retreat in peace. What are you going to do? Build a building, write a book, paint a picture. How long will it last? You die. How long do the buildings last these days? They tear them down and build new ones. The pyramids, that was quite an accomplishment. (laughs) Has anyone seen them lately? They're wearing down. The Sphinx, they're having trouble even kind of keeping it there. It's falling apart. You know, and that was, that was a great one. What are you going to make that's in terms of the timelessness of this world that's going to last? The world is just this globe, this earth I talked about hanging in black space with these big, huge balls of fire way out there. You know, and if you can look down from a distance, there are all these little ant-like things crawling around and pretending that they're important and building little ant piles and then they get torn down and building other ones. I mean, really? (laughs) Thus shall you see this fleeting world, says in the Diamond Sutra. A star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, a phantom, and a dream. And it really brings this tremendous sense of joy, of lightness, of seeing that all this is really is theater. It's the cosmic theater. And you say, well, what about the tragedies? And it's not to say not to respond to them. Somebody asked Don Juan about them, though. They said, you know, I mean, it's all, it's a nice idea, but how about when it really touches home? Like when your grandson died. And he said, let's not take my grandson, let's take my own son. He said, when I saw my son die in front of my eyes, he was crushed to death by a earth moving machine building the Pan American Highway. He said, at first I looked with him, looked at him with this terror and grief in my heart. And then I looked again with my eyes of controlled folly. And I saw even that, even death, even sorrow. What is that? It's the play of light and shadow. It's what we are. Life and death are not separate. Do you think death is different than life? Every moment we're born, every moment we die, The very fact of birth means the fact of death. They can't be separated. If you deny life, if you deny death, rather, you must deny life. 
And controlled folly is saying, right, far out, okay, let's have it, let's do it. And seeing that, that it's the doing, it's the living, it's the loving itself that is our life and nothing else. Sasaki Roshi, the man who preferred interviews to the movies, if you recall, was asked at one point why he came to this country to teach. And there was a brochure that was sent out with this big picture of him. He's a 75-year-old Zen Roshi, very powerful. And underneath it said, when asked why he came to this country to teach, Roshi replied, I let others do the teaching. I came to America, I came to have a good time. I want Americans to learn how to truly laugh. And it's really that spirit of controlled folly. It's a sense that all the things we do that we think are important, the most important thing is just how we are in each moment, with each person, with each thing, in its own self, in its own being. And that everything we have Everything we hold on to, everything we want, everything we get, everything we don't get, is all going to pass and change. Too bad. That's how it is. And so you don't even have to think about giving it all up. You know, you don't have to make that choice. It's already made. I hope I have time for the other three. (laughs) The three other qualities of enlightenment, the factors of enlightenment, are the stabilizing qualities. These three were energy and willingness to be present, not to check out, or willingness when you check out to really check out, but see where you go, you know? (laughs) Willingness, that's energy. Um, Courage, willingness to really see, to be honest, to take responsibility for who's happy and who's sad and whose fault is it, and what's really here, to be honest in our speech, to be courageous in opening in ourselves. And this lightness, this joy, this controlled folly, not taking ourselves so seriously. The three stabilizing ones I can go through a little more quickly. They're also important, and they're why we take the time to do sitting practice as well as do practice in our daily life in the world. Why it's helpful. Because these ones grow strong in this, and we need them. The fifth is strength, strength of mind, which really means the power of mind to be concentrated, to be present, to be steady. Don Juan at one point told Carlos, Carlos said, you know, God, I've gone through 10 years of apprenticeship and I took mescaline and I went out in the desert and I did all these things and, you know, won't you now tell me what's the truth, what's the heart, the essence of the practice, of the, of the Dharma, of what you're teaching, whatever his word was, just the truth. Don Juan says, I'm sorry, I can't tell you yet. He said, why not? He was, he was upset. He said, because you haven't got enough personal power And without it, you won't understand me. What's this personal power? Personal power means a mind that's deep enough, that's open enough, that's steady enough to see what is true. How many times have we been told the truth or read it in all those great spiritual books? Do you want me to tell you? Listen real carefully. You don't exist. You do not exist as something separate. It's not true. It seems like it seems very solid and real, and it's not. It's one unified field, movement, perception, with no body separate in there. We're one. Okay, thanks. Okay, you can go home. Now, why not? Why don't we see that? And why don't we live it is the question. It's a nice idea. Because somehow it hasn't gurgled and filtered and gotten down in there where it's a part of us. And that's what this quality of strength, of concentration, of depth of mind is. Somehow getting silent enough and still enough that we can really feel in the deepest way every moment the birth and death of our very existence, 
of sight, sound, taste, smell, bodily perception, and mental perception. That's all those six things coming and going with the consciousness of them, and that is it. To see it, to sense it, to feel that we're not solid. And some of you probably started to feel that as you sit, or even as you go about, you know, your tasks around here. Start to feel that you're not as separate as you think you are. You get quieter, and you start to feel, instead of being busy with me and what I'm going to do. The sixth quality is peacefulness. And this sense of strength, of concentration, and the sense of peacefulness also aren't some ideal, but they're really, you can feel them. They grow as we practice awareness. They come out of our awareness. Strength of mind comes from awareness. There's a special kind of concentration called kanika samadhi in Sanskrit that grows as we pay attention. So does, so does the quality of peacefulness. Peacefulness doesn't mean passiveness, but it means a, not an aggressive relationship to the world. The hunter uses their world sparingly and with tenderness. tenderness. They deal intimately with their world, and yet they remain inaccessible. What does that mean? Tenderness, caring, intimacy. The inaccessibility means they don't get hooked. They don't get attached. It's a thing that we're learning. To be intimate. Some people think, well, to do meditation means that I stand out here and I watch and now he's doing this and now he's eating and now he's having thoughts. That helps a little in the beginning. It's okay. But it's more coming back in, finally, reeling it back in, you know, getting back in here and feeling ourselves when we walk, when we eat, when we move, being in it, experiencing it with awareness, with a tenderness and a caring, and yet also not getting too hung up on it with aversion and like and dislike and all, or aversion and dislike come saying, fine, looking at those two with awareness. Peacefulness. It's wonderful. San Juan de la Cruz, St. John of the Cross, said, the conditions of the solitary bird are five. First, that it flies to the highest point. The second, that it does not suffer for company, even of its own kind. Third, that it aims its beak to the sky. The fourth, that it does not have a definite color. And the last, that it sings very softly. Peacefulness, in a way, means taking a rest from our our liking and disliking. You know, somehow we get the idea, partly I think it comes from elementary school in America, forgive me those of you who are not Americans, about freedom being to do what we want. American freedom is to drink the kind of beer that we'd like, which the Russians only have one kind, they're not free, and to buy the kind of cars that we want. That's good old American Bill of Rights freedom. That's crap. You know, look at it. All, it's all conditioned. Advertising, you know, this kind of person drives that kind of car. It's all just cultural conditioning. We don't realize how deep that is. Look at what you're attracted to in, in opposite sex or same sex, whatever, the kind of person that turns you on. Okay, and you think, well, gee, there's something really organic I like. Personally, I like women that are this shape and that color and whatever. I like men that are like this or that. In the South Seas, in a number of different cultures in the South Seas, a woman or a man is not considered beautiful and attractive and handsome if they're less than 350 pounds. Everyone in this room is ugly. (laughs) This is true. This is really serious. We are totally conditioned. That's not freedom and all that stuff. That's just doing what you want. And mostly what you want is just what the kind of tapes that are put in. This peacefulness really talks about a much deeper kind of freedom in our lives. In that sense, it's really the freedom from all of that conditioning. And that really brings a lot of peace to know that. 
It's not the freedom of doing and getting what we want, but somehow in ourselves, it's the freedom, freedom from wanting. It's taking a break, taking a rest. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have lots of desires still. You will, I do. Everybody, almost everyone I know does. Might be a couple of exceptions, but really rare. But rather, not being so caught in them, not being so stuck by them. And again, that's what we're doing here. It's not some theoretical thing. You sit here and you want to get up and you look at that and you sit, you know, or you feel afraid and you look at that and you don't want to feel it. And you do, you feel it anyway. You know, or you go and eat and you want more or less or you watch yourself go through your desires and, and aversions and you look and that starts to make us free. Every moment of that, Every moment of awareness is freedom. And that brings us to the last of these qualities, which is steadfastness or equanimity. And maybe that's the one that grows, the blossoms the most beautifully in our practice. Not just sitting, but in everything that we do here and really in our lives, when we make our lives practice, if we're willing to do that, which is to say when we're aware Steadfastness is equanimity. It's called divine equilibrium in the Christian tradition. Actually, in Latin, the word is apatheia, divine apathy. It's not really apathy. It's not a not caring, but it's an openness that lets things change without getting struggled, freaked out, upset. really lets things be as they are with a centeredness. impeccability, living wholeheartedly, dying into each moment, knowing that this is our last moment, our last day, our death. Energy, the willingness to do it. Courage, taking responsibility for who makes us happy and sad, and really being willing in our courage to be honest outwardly in our words and our actions and honest inwardly with what's true in ourselves, to feel it, to open to it. Controlled folly, having a good time doing it. doesn't have to be grim, you know. My teachers often said, listen, this can be lighthearted. It doesn't have to be grim at all. Bring a light heart to it. And then strength of mind, steadiness, concentration, peacefulness, and equanimity, a balance. To see the waves, I mean, the waves don't stop, but to see them, to feel them. We're not the same, even though I said we don't exist and we're the same and so forth. We're also very different individuals. And each one of us, sometimes I think of these retreats like a greenhouse for Buddhists. We're all here like plants and kind of getting watered and sitting here and growing. And each one will be a totally different color and flavor and shape and expression. And I've had the fortune of being with many, many different teachers. Some I liked, some I didn't like, some who were crazy and madmen and and some who were very dignified gurus and some of whom were were kind of timid and um, shy, every kind. And each one of them, when they were good, expressed the Dharma in their own way, as each of you will. And it's to sense that, to sense the nourishment, the growing in yourself of greater equanimity and greater wholeheartedness in being able to be here, and greater honesty in what you do here And what you do here is preparation for all the rest of your practice, which is when you're not here. So I close with a quote from Don Gennaro. Actually, it's from Don Juan about Don Gennaro, the other shaman in the book. He says, Gennaro's love is the world. He was just now embracing this enormous earth, but since he's so little, all he can do is swim on it. 
But the earth knows that Gennaro loves it, and it bestows on him its care. That's why Gennaro's life is filled to the brim, and his state, wherever he goes, will be plentiful. Only if one loves this earth with unbending passion can one release one's sadness. Warrior is always joyful because their love is unalterable and their beloved, the earth, embraces them and bestows upon them inconceivable gifts. Only the love of this splendorous life can give freedom to a warrior's spirit. And this freedom is joy, efficiency, and abandon in the face of any odds. That's the last lesson. It's always left for the very last moment, for the moment of ultimate solitude, when a person faces their death and aloneness. Only then does it make sense. What we do here, what we learn, work with it, to me is the most wonderful and important thing that we can do in our lives. And I don't mean sitting is, but I mean the inner spirit of taking the time now and carrying it through in our lives to learn this, to, to, to be full, to be open, to be honest. And not just in glib ways, because those are the trademark words of every therapy and every spiritual thing and Dale Carnegie and all the rest of it. I don't mean that. I mean somehow in the heart. And I appreciate this retreat a lot. I feel like people have worked pretty hard, you know, and gone through a lot. And that's what it's about for me. I don't mind that it's hard at all. I'm kind of glad in a way, you know. And I don't mind that people are challenged in what they do. Any questions, please? Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful question, actually. In, in the uh, Eastern psychology, mindfulness has a couple of several different functions. Its primary function is to notice or be with the experience as it is, so that we're not spaced out or lost or judging it or condemning it or holding on. It's to be with it in an open way. That's its primary function. Its second function is to bring with it the other factors of enlightenment. When we take the trouble to be aware with the things that we do in our life, all these other qualities come with it. As we're aware, so steadiness of mind grows. As we're aware, so peacefulness grows in us. As we're aware, energy develops and grows in that fullness. As we're aware, courage and and truth and lightness grows. All those factors come with it. The third thing, first, its function is to experience things without resisting or changing them. Second, its function is to bring with it the factors of enlightenment. And the third function is to balance them all. The awareness in any moment brings the mind into balance. And if you're feeling sleepy or you're feeling over-energetic or you feel different things, the mind is out of balance. The moment you become aware of that, the mind writes itself. Even just by noticing being sleepy in that moment, the mind comes to balance. Even if the sleepiness is still there, it becomes the object then instead of being out of balance. And there's a balance around it. Or feeling restless. And you note and aware of feeling restless in that moment. That's the object and the mind comes into balance to see things, to open to them. So mindfulness is really a dull word. You know, I mean, there are all these great spiritual terms of the passion of this and, and uh, devotion and, and samadhi and all these things, mindfulness. You know? 
And it's a pity because it's such an extraordinary thing. Mindfulness. The fullness of mind, heart, body being together. Or impeccability, that way of living in the world one moment to another. For me, the world is incredible, says Don Juan, because it's stupendous, awesome, mysterious, unfathomable. My interest has been to convince you that you must assume responsibility for being here in this marvelous world, in this marvelous time. I've wanted to convince you that you must learn to make every act count since you're going to be here for only a short while, in fact, too short, for witnessing all the marvels of it. Tremendous sense of appreciation of the world, of life, of all the things that we touch. And of course, some people are slower than others in getting this. Carlos Castaneda was very slow, you know. If Don Juan had taken him out to the desert and said, okay, Carlos, as he did, I'm going to leave you here for a couple of days. Now I want you to sit for 45 minutes, then walk for 45 minutes, and then sit again, be aware of your breath and your steps, and then left him. What would Castaneda have done? Probably fallen asleep. It's pretty boring, you know, as you may have noticed. (laughs) But instead, he took him out to the desert and he said, Carlos, today you are going to meet the ally. The ally is coming. You might not see the ally, or you might. The ally might come as an animal or as a spirit. Carlos was terrified. (laughs) Don Juan said, I'll be back in a couple of days. You wait and see the ally. He sat there. Was he mindful? You know, all right. What's going to happen? Some people need that. It helps. It's true. But it's the same process. It's the process of our opening to what's really here. Okay, please, take a walk. (laughs) Thank you.